All right. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Uh, going well, sir. How are you? Oh, I am good. I am good. So you, while we have recorded this, have had a super busy week releasing a new book called The Problem of Jesus, which I am almost finished. I didn't quite finish it yet, but I'm almost there. Are and it is. Yeah, I, I bought the audio and I was like, I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to plow through it. Turn it well, on. Good for you. Listen to it. No, it's been, uh, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like this one more than The Problem of God, but actually like, and I'm not just saying this, I think in my opinion, I like this book more, which I didn't wow. think I would because I very much like The Problem of God. Um, yeah, I think it was super well written. And even the stuff you tackled surprised me because it was some stuff that I haven't heard a lot of Christian thinkers tackle before. Because usually when they talk about Jesus, it's just the historicity of it and all those things. So no, it right. was awesome. Yeah, well, thank I you. I, I, I appreciate that. I, uh, yeah, you know, you put these things out to the world and who knows where they go and who knows how people receive them, you know? So, uh, it's been, uh, so far a delight hearing some, some stories, you know, people like, like you, where it's like, Hey, you know, I started the audio book. There was a guy who was on uh, Twitter talking about, I started the audio book and then, uh, um, you know, he intended to listen to like a bit of it, he said, or something. And he, now, and then he said, I'm six hours in and I can't stop or whatever. So it's yeah. like, okay, I like, you know, that's a good, you know, good little thing. I, I heard a story today. I just posted uh, from my friend in Amsterdam. Mm. He, uh, I, it's a great, great picture. It's, it's his Amazon uh, delivery on his porch. And there's one book. Uh and it's it's been ripped open. And he said he ordered <laughs> he ordered like five or ten or something. And and someone stole all of them, but left wow. one. And That's so awesome. he was like, you know, he's like the he's like the reason I ordered them was to give them away. So hopefully these thieves, you know, meet Jesus and you know, so it's pretty funny. Yeah. So it's fun watching the stories anyway. Man, that's awesome. That's so cool. Um so for this podcast, we've gone over this before, but we're really trying to tackle um, the tagline is to that this whole thing is to help you reconstruct while you're deconstructing so you don't self-destruct. And I think for a lot of people in my life, especially those going through deconstruction, like this topic of the problem of Jesus is huge. Um, and it's something that I find there's a lot of confusion on or just a lot of not of effort to figure out the truth. Cause once you get into the deconstruction zone, depending mm. on how far the rabbit trail you're going down, I've, I found that people just start to try less and less to actually dig into things and just start to be like, nah, it's all dumb. Sure. Um, and so I really wanted to talk to you about some of the things in your book. Cause some of it is like super helpful. And I think to a lot of the listeners, it'll be like, Oh wow. Like this is something I haven't really thought through before. And, and it, at the beginning of your book, you say something that surprised me. You said that Jesus is scandalous or he's a scandal. And I wanted to ask you, like, why, why is Jesus a scandal? Why is he scandalous? What, what makes him that? Most people think he's just like some good guy. Right. Who, yeah. Who, I mean, when you read, yeah, we, we kind of pitched him as, you know, I think I say the Sunday school, the Tony Robbins meets, you know, uh, meets Mr. Rogers kind of, you know, winking at our little problems and, and mostly just like daft old uncle in the garden, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. And he wasn't that, of course. He dies as a 33-year-old revolutionary. You know, when the Roman Empire writes the charge and, and they talk about him being, you know, what he's dying for, he dies beside two what are called brigands or in the Greek lestai, mm. which were, were not guys stealing purses in the, uh, in the local, you know, marketplace. These are guys who had a, a planned revolution against the Roman Empire. Uh. And we forget that Jesus died as a, and it says a political revolutionary against the empire that existed at the time, mm. you know, so he, he's, he, you know, he's, he's, he's Luke Skywalker fighting the empire uh, and they kill him. And, um, and we forget it. So when you move backwards from there, you know, when he goes into the temple and throws open, you know, it's, it's fascinating in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's, it's Jesus goes into the temple, you know, late in his ministry. Um, and in John, he goes in in chapter two, and there's a debate about whether he went in twice or whether John moves the story to earlier in his ministry. Um, but only in John do you hear he, it's this great little line that I've, I've always loved and it's haunting. He, he made a whip. Yeah. What? What does that mean? You know, so he, go, so, so like, let's set the scene, right? He goes into the temple 
And there, mm-hmm. he's, there's a bunch of guys doing a bunch of nonsense that he doesn't like because it's taking away from, from Gentiles being able to focus on prayer and, and worship and whatever. And they're selling stuff and it's loud and, it, you know, whatever. And so he, he consciously, he doesn't just like oh, just turn over kind of one table and then they get mad and a few coins fall on the ground. So he stops himself and he goes, okay, I'm going to, how long does this take? A couple hours? He goes over <laughs> in the corner. He grabs some whatever you make a whip with, leather, hair from a horse, I don't know. And he sits down and he starts curling it up and chatting with you. And the guy takes two hours or whatever to make a whip. And then mm. he starts whipping things. <laughs> you know, it's like now he's Indiana Jones and he's <laughs> throwing table. You know, what's happening here? This guy, yeah. that anyway, that's part of the scandal is like he was uh, had some pieces about him that were confrontational. Of course, for all of us, there is like a soul confrontation that needs to mm. go down where it's like, I don't think he lets us away with. I'm good. Uh, the category mistake of I'm going to reject God uh, because the church mismanages, you know, is bad PR managers for God like that mm. to me. And I know that's a big part of deconstruction is like, let's reject God based on how Christians are. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that can, can oftentimes lead to a category mistake. I mean, if you're a Muslim and you're trying to live out your faith legitimately uh, and you simply say, well, you know, there's some, some, some fanatical Muslims who, who, who flew planes into buildings, ergo, I'm going to, you know, walk away from all the teachings of Islam, you know, Mm -hmm. it might be like, Hey, maybe don't do that. Yeah, no. And, and I think that um, that scandal is is very intriguing because I think that uh, especially in our world in Canada, people like we're post Christian. We've forgotten even the Christian story, and I don't even know if everyone knew it well to begin with. But the thing is that I know there are people hearing that who go, "Yeah, but Mark, don't you know that like this is just like Jesus wasn't real? So like he's a scandal, but he's a made up scandal. He's just a myth. He's just like Zeus or." any of those other gods there's no historicity to him there's no proof that he existed what would you say to that where people start to come to you and be like nah there's just like that's a great story but it's just not real yeah i mean so so we talk about that in the first chapter and the idea that you know there are people who are enemies of christianity writing uh meaning they're not they're not part of the part of the conspiracy Mm. um the guys outside judaism at times or writing for the Roman Empire, certainly not friends of Christianity, um, at least potentially seven, eight, ten of them um, during that time that are writing history that mention Jesus by name. Now, some of those scholars, you know, come and go, oh, no, they, you know, that one's been shown to this or whatever, but the collection of them um, has been shown to be historically legitimate. And mm-hmm. they're talking about things about Jesus that if you just took the things they said about him. So not gospel writers now, just historians that happen to mention him, the things they mention about him. And if you were to compile all of those things, it it gives this crazy portrait of Jesus, you know, a, he existed obviously, or else why are they talking about him? Mm -hmm. Um, B that people called him the Messiah at some level. Now they, they don't interpret that for us. So, you know um, that he did miracles or at least the people claim to, but they're, they're, they're saying, man, this is kind of a thing um, that he led Israel astray uh, because he, he started like redefining, you know, what faithfulness to Israel yeah. was and all the rest of it. Um, and that he healed people um, that he, he was a storyteller, what they, they use the word parabolist, you know, mm. uh, or a parabolist. Um, a, you know, as, as a definitive category. And I do a whole chapter, of course, on Jesus parables. Yeah. Um, and then uh, that he died under Pontius Pilate and that his, that his followers claimed that they saw him risen from the dead and then went on to be tortured, hundreds of them for that claim. Mm-hmm. Um, so even without the Bible, you know, that's the portrait we get. Mm-hmm. Now we don't get the details of every teaching, but we certainly get an interesting portrait from a historical stand and so in fact you know uh, it, it's argued that maybe even Pontius Pilate wasn't even someone who history ever would have mentioned outside of the gospels talking about yeah him. 
And so uh, archaeology has dug and found legitimacy to the historicity of Jesus um, and the historicity of the stories that 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 tell the story about Jesus, whether that's Luke mentioning X amount of you know cities and islands and leaders and you know, all this stuff just continuously is like vindicated as history. Mm. Uh, and so most people would go, yeah, okay, T to the point where, as I talk about, you know, you take something like N.T. Wright's Jesus book, eight hundred pages. Yeah. You know, here, look for your for for the people watching. Okay, so here, here's a book about Jesus by one of the most respected historians in the world, okay? Like mm -hmm. small print, you know, whatever. His comment about whether Jesus existed is one sentence. It's, I'm not even going to deal with that. <laughs> I'm not even going to deal with that because it's not even a question any historian is really even debating. Guys out in the mm -hmm. street, you know, with little signs and, and uh, might debate it, but no historian working at Oxford or whatever is actually even talking about this anymore. Anyway, all that to say, we can, yeah. we can trust that he existed. No. And that's the crazy thing too, is that um, the more I've dug into it, the more I've realized that it's not just Christian historians like an NT right. Who say these things like it's non-Christian historians go, there's no doubt that Jesus was a true person who existed. And where the yeah. debate is, is whether or not he is God. And so I, yeah, or I whether ask, he said what he, yeah, or whether he yeah, said, whether he what he said, said or he, he said. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I want to ask you, like, what proof is there? Is there any proof that Jesus was God who Christians claimed that he was? Um, was is there any way that we can know now? Because we're like 2021 years removed from him being around here, I guess probably 2000 years removed. So it's like I, I can't see it for myself. So is there any like proof? that I can look at in history to go like, maybe this guy was more than just another uh, Muhammad or, or Zeus, or maybe uh, like Allah, like why, why not one of these things? Why, why is Jesus God over these other religions who all have their own stories? Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting. And I, and I, there's a whole chapter on this in the book about um, he's none of these other leaders ever claimed to be God. Um, mm. You know, even the Buddha didn't claim to be God. Other people claimed it about him potentially like he's a mm -hmm. you know he's a representation of the divine or something on earth but um it was really only with buddha and jesus that people didn't say you know who is this man but what is he you know it's mm -hmm. it's like there's something transcendent about him um and so what we what we have is jesus uh we would have to kind of work backwards from a few things we would say do we trust the gospels and then we can get in you know because basically to, to to get to the point where you're going to believe that jesus is god you've got to get to the point where you actually believe he claimed to be which is of course you know debated mm -hmm. uh but if you trust the gospels and their representation of jesus which i think is is legitimate uh, and, and history keeps showing why you can trust them. Then you've got to deal with, you know, did, okay, then, then let's look at them and see what they say. And what they say across the board is that he claimed to be God. Now he didn't do it. People say, well, did he, you know, did he claim to be God in the sense of he said, he strung together these three words, I am God. Well, no, uh, not like that, but that's that's a, that's anachronistic of us to desire him to say this for for, for yeah. a couple of reasons. First, because it wouldn't have meant anything to them because mm. uh, there's lots of people who claim to be God in the sense of we're the divine, right? So so Eastern mysticism believes that we're all part of the divine consciousness and and you have the divine spark in you. And so there's entire religions where that actually wouldn't have been much of a scandal. Yeah. You know, I was in India a few years ago, and when you're driving around India, you can't, there's cows everywhere, and you have to stop in traffic, and if that cow sits there for 20 minutes, you're in traffic for 20 minutes, you know, people try to move them along or whatever, but the point is, is they're divine. You, mm. you, they, you, can't, you can't eat a cow in India, you know, yeah. because they're gods, you mm. know, so, so, so a guy comes, I'm God, it's like, all right, join the, join the list. Um, so, so there's that sense, but then, so, so in what way did he then claim to, well, he, he did something more scandalous. He, he did it in a way, both in, both in uh, his words and his actions, 
that would have made it clear that he was Israel's God. He did it in a mm. way that first century Jews would have understood mm. him to be doing it. And that's part of the question is like, he doesn't do it in the way a Canadian might say it. He does it in a way that a first century Jew would say it. And that's why when you read through the gospels, they're continuously saying he made himself out equal with, to be equal with God, let's kill him. You know, he made himself out to be equal with God. Let's do this with him. Yeah. And that's because of what he was saying and doing, you know, mm. the, he was doing things that only the God of Israel does. He was saying, claiming things about himself that only Yahweh would say, this is true about me. And then mm. you get the crazy reality of, of the rest of the early Christians who were pretty conservative Jews mm who go away and rethink their entire theology and reshape now what they mean by the word God around Jesus. I mean, that's the mm. most mind blowing thing is a, you know, a Jew like Paul or Peter, whatever, they're actually going away and taking these Deuteronomy passages and writing them and going, Jesus is the center of now these passages that we thought were, you know, were about this. And now mm. we realize, Oh my goodness. So you know, uh, it's pretty clear the early Christians believe that and died for it. Yeah. So, so that makes me wonder, cause I think, um, a lot of times if people do kind of have an idea about Jesus, that what you're saying is something that gets missed, um, where we just, we just take it for granted where it's like, oh, he said he was God and he died for sins. And that's about it. Like we skipped the whole, cause you're talking about like Jesus coming and like saying things and doing things. And so I want to ask you like, what, what were the things that he was doing that made himself out to, to be this Messiah or, or um, Israel's God coming down to earth in flesh, one person, part of the Trinity? Like what, what were some of the things that he did? Like, what was his goal on earth? Like, why not just show up, bust open the doors and be like, Hey, I'm here guys. Time to fall down and worship me. That's what I'm here to do. Like, why, why did he do all the things he did? Cause yeah. we usually just jump to like three chapters at the end of the gospel, but there's like a whole bunch of chapters before that of him doing stuff. What's the point of that stuff just to prove that he's God or what? Right. Yeah. I think, I think I say in the book, we Christians have a really good answer to why Jesus died, but we don't have a great answer to why he lived. Mm. Um, and so part of the reason why he lived uh, was to, of course, reveal this question you're asking about in a way that um, kind of subverted expectations. And so whether it's um, whether it's you know a guy coming through a roof needing to be healed and he and he says you know your sins are forgiven which of course you know um, no one but God in that sense can can declare that or he talks about himself you know um, being the one who kind of gives the Sabbath um, you know he's constantly putting himself in these roles that only God would be in mm. they would only they, people pray to him. He's claiming to actually be God. He's not claiming to just say, I'm speaking on behalf of God. He's saying, I'm changing the Torah hmm. or I'm updating it. I'm now, you know, so it's not just, I'm a new Moses. I'm a new Yahweh. It's like, so Neusser is like, I, I don't think I could have followed this guy as a Jew in the first century. Like this is crazy. Um, but then he does all these fun, like little, you know, uh, kind of, I talked about the, the Israel in person stuff where he puts, he chooses 12 disciples because there's 12 tribes of Israel and he's reconstituting yeah. Israel around himself. He goes through the waters of baptism and then goes out into the wilderness for 40 days, representing Israel, going through the waters of the Red Sea and going out into the wilderness for 40 years. And then, you know, when he's fighting Satan in the wilderness for those 40 days, he's all three quotes that Matthew records are from Deuteronomy, which is the story mm -hmm. of Israel in the desert fighting Satan. You know, all of these great, like, it's now me, guys. I'm where all this story has come down to. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like the, the, the salvation plan of God, like, started with Abraham, you know, as this one point, and then it moved out to an entire people you know, Israel, you are called to be the light of the world through you. I'm going to redeem the world. And then it comes back again to one pointed person again, mm -hmm. which is the representative of this people accomplishing what, you know, the people couldn't necessarily do in themselves. Yeah. And that's so interesting that like, um, just the amount that we can miss in our Western context and reading the gospels. Cause we, we often, most of us don't have that Jewish background 
And right. so we often miss that, like anti rights been super helpful for me in this, where it's like, wow, like I really didn't fully understand everything Jesus was doing and saying until I go back to the Old Testament and sit down and study, because there's so much that you're just going to miss. Like, you're just not going to understand the language he's talking, even like I'm the son of man and stuff like to us. It's like, okay, what does that mean? I have no idea. But right, they're thinking, right. oh, it's Daniel. Oh, he's, he's right. the guy we've been waiting for. And so once right. you see all that, the whole story starts to shift. And I think that that's interesting too. And you point this out um, when you talk about the gospels, about how even now today, we struggle to read the gospels correctly because we are living in North America in the 21st century and we just don't have the same lens. And some of the things they do actually make us a little spooked, like um, how John kind of rearranges stories a little bit to like get his actual point across. And that for some people is like a hurdle where it's like, well, if they're rearranging stuff to tell certain stories, even yesterday I was reading in Mark um, where, where Jesus asked his disciples, he's like, ah, oh, who, who do you guys say I am? And they're like, oh, I don't know. All these people said kinds of things. And, the, and and Peter eventually goes, oh yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're the Messiah. You're like, you're the one you've been waiting for. And then the story before it's about Jesus, like opening the eyes of a blind man. And the story before it is about Jesus being angry that they don't get who he is yet. And it's like, oh, Mark's like setting this up as a story yes. to tell the bigger story. And so I want to ask you like, what are some of the ways that we've misread or can misread the gospels today? But then also like, how do we, because I know when I first found this out in Bible college, it made me really nervous because you're so used to a biography being like right. the Steve Jobs biography. We're like, oh yeah, this is exactly what happened. Um, but how do we get over some of those hurdles that we as modern readers either don't see or freak us out a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think first thing we have to do is go, don't put modern projections of the way we do things back on history, right? Because mm -hmm. that's not the way they did biography back then. Um, they weren't forced to tell either chronology uh, in the sense that we think about it. And they weren't forced to, uh, th there was always a, there was always an intent of the author. Um, and, and I think I talk, I talk about James Dunn, who's a historian and a scholar. And he talks about the idea that like really no history is written from a, from a completely neutral standpoint. Mm. You look at like, you know uh, you know, Ellie Wiesel's uh, night book or whatever. I mean, it's like, he's a Holocaust, he's in the Holocaust and Frank, yeah. it's like, she's writing her story. Um, and it's like, we don't go, well, you know, Anne Frank, uh, that was quite a, you know, she clearly had an agenda. Let's toss that out. And it's like, <laughs> uh, no, this is probably really good history, you know? So it's mm. like, these guys were writing a story um, that did have theological intent. And back in the first century, the, the kind of biography they were writing, you had the freedom to shape stories around theological intent. And so Mark gathers his parables in chapter four. And, uh, you know, there, there's all these things that they do um, to present Jesus in a particular way. And no one back then went, okay, that means they're not, they're not accurate you know, they're not true. And so they're, they're literally writing, but of course they keep rooting it in history. You know, one of the, one of the things I talk about is like the eyewitness stuff of Mark keeps naming everybody, you know, this guy carried it and he was the son of this guy. And this guy did this yeah. and he was this guy, Jairus's daughter. And it's like, every time they're doing that, Richard Bachman wrote a book years ago saying that's because they're, they're telling everyone, if you doubt this, go ask them because they're still alive. Mm -hmm. you know what's the point of just naming a guy if you're just like you know and, and he says hey uh Aiden's over there he was like I don't know who that is you know whatever it's like <laughs> he's saying it because they know who he is they and they can go talk to him you know and and so they're saying like this is legitimate history so we don't have to be nervous about it uh we just mm -hmm. have to realize that um it actually makes the bible more interesting mm -hmm. you know because now it's not just it's not just, you know, prose, it's art, it's poetry. And that doesn't just make the mind engage, it makes the heart engage because now we're like, okay, now we're watching a TV show. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just reading a dry biography on Churchill or whatever. And it's like, he was born in 18, you know, it's like, now it's like, I'm, I'm coming with intent. I want to shape mm -hmm. your heart. I want you to see, you know, and I, so I think that's, that's beautiful. You know, it's not, you know, when we put music behind something, we don't, we don't say, oh, you know, now there's music behind it. I think it's not true. Yeah. 
you know, I, I so that's what the gospel writers are doing. Hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's just, um, I don't know what, it, I feel like maybe in the last couple of years, I don't know if churches have really helped people. Cause I, I was given, uh, I grew up in church. And so I was given like, really um, like the cliche answers where it's like, oh yeah, it's all historically accurate. Like, don't worry about it. And then you learn some of that stuff and you're like, oh, and you start to like buckle against it. But once you can like kind of get over that and realize, oh, like this doesn't, it doesn't mean that these stories aren't true. It just means that when John, Mark, Matthew are writing these things out, that they like have an intention, like any story author does that mm -hmm. it's like, um, it's like any good uh, biographical movie. Even I just watched Chernobyl a few weeks ago, which is an HBO series about the nuclear plant exploding in Chernobyl. And there are things at the end that they admit to that they took out of context, put it here because it made the story flow and make more sense. Sure. Um, and it's like, it doesn't mean that that part is untrue. It's just that right. in the narrative we're telling, it makes more sense to put this story here than here. And yeah. that when we watch movies and stuff, we don't freak out and go, oh no, I can't trust her job. It's more just like, no, they're just doing something different. But for the gospels, for some reason, we just start to freak yeah. out a little bit. It's a, it's a good example. It's almost like, um, this is another random weird example, but um, when, I don't know if you ever saw, um, what was it, The People versus O.J. Simpson? No, I haven't you seen it yet. It? Okay, so no. so O.J. murders, well, supposedly, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, does the murders in 94. Mm. But the series opens, and I just thought of this analogy when you, when you made your Chernobyl point. The series actually opens with the beating of Rodney King in 1992 in L.A., Mm. And, the, and and seemingly has nothing to do with it. But in saying that, they're arguing there was a there was a historical context, an emotional context, let's just say, um, to the, the trial that OJ had. And it was there was an entire city that had been rocked two years previous mm. about the beating of Rodney King and the, and the, and the riots that ensued that is the context for the trial of OJ Simpson. So mm. when he gets off, understand there was this bigger, you know, cultural ethos going on. Uh, and that helps you rationally go, oh my gosh, I mean, he's so guilty, oh, but they let him, oh, I, you know, oh, I remember because it opened with the beating of Rodney King. So it's like, mm. it's like they're trying, the gospel writers are trying to provide context as well so you understand the, the the emotional context of what's going on sometimes so you know when john john just doesn't say hey there was six stone water pots and jesus said fill them up he says oh by the way let me tell let me look to the camera you know like woody allen or something and annie hall you know let me look to the camera and go this is what these six water pots were for they were for the jewish mm -hmm. rites of purification back to the story you know so now you know why it matters you know so anyway so mm -hmm. so i think it's it makes it fun no and that makes um studying the bible a lot more interesting too because it's not like i'm just going to this to get a bunch of head knowledge for whatever for my systematic theology that's in my brain it's like i'm going to this to like i want to dig into it and figure out like what's going on because even yeah. um the episode before you uh that we just released was with phil can and he showed me a uh, coin from rome and he flipped it on the back and on the back there's a reed blowing in the wind and it's so interesting that once you see that and get that you're like oh when jesus goes and talks about john the baptist and is mm. like getting at the jews and he's like what what'd you guys come out here for did you come out here to see a reed blowing in the wind he's like oh he's talking about like caesar and rome he's like roman you didn't empire come out here stuff. to see a, another roman empire you came out here to see something else it's like once you start to get that stuff this stuff just comes alive and is i don't know to me it's way more exciting than just another biography it was already exciting as a biography but this is just so much more and, yeah. and great um lastly as we kind of close here and wrap up um i think that if someone is really wrestling with the idea of whether or not jesus was real whether he was god and what it means for our lives i highly recommend that you buy Mark's book. But as we're listening to this, I know that for some of us, it's like, yeah, like Mark's saying some stuff and it, you know what, it's hard for me to deny the historical Jesus. And it is hard to kind of believe that you could convince 12 guys to all tell the same lie and die for it. Like you think one of them would have, would have given it up or something like, it's like, yeah. Well, it would have been hundreds is, of people, not just 12. 
Yeah. So yeah. it makes it like if this seems ridiculous. Even the fact that Paul, some guy who like hated the Christians and went out and persecuted them, had this huge conversion story and transformed. It's like, yeah, once you start to add this stuff up, it's, the evidence becomes hard to kind of ignore. And so I just want to ask you, like, for those of us here who are listening to this, who are going, you know what, this Jesus thing, this this Christian thing, there might be actually something to it. Um, what does it now mean for someone who's starting to wrestle with that and go, you know what, I think Jesus might be true. I think he might be God. Um, what are they What are they called to do? What's the next step? What are What are we supposed to do with this good news that the gospel writers call it um, that that's been presented to us about Jesus and who he is? Well, I mean, part of it is being um, getting into the gospels themselves. You know, Augustine said the Bible is the face of God for us now. And mm -hmm. it's like there is real power in the Bible and, and, and making sure that you then approach it. You know, there's the there's the word and then there's the word behind the word. And it's like, I want you to get to know God you know, through the text versus just the text. And, 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 you know, Jesus warned a bunch of guys in John five, he's like, you study the scriptures, but you don't even know God, you know, it's crazy. So, yeah. um, so I would say, you know, try to honestly come to the scriptures and let them, as you're talking about, let them like blow you away and then, and mm -hmm. then be seeking out the God behind the scriptures. That's how I, you know, that Jesus was like reading the Bible, smoking my cigarettes, hanging out with people, whatever. People, and I'm like, boom, I, I met God, man. And it was crazy. So, you know, allow that scandal to kind of overtake you. Uh, question, you know, your doubts. Um, why are you denying? Why you, uh, you know, what are the real reasons behind there? Like, I know what you're citing. You're citing, you know, some epistemological reason or something. But really, mm. why? Um, is it because of the sexual ethic or because of, you know, you don't you, the courage to be like, no, I, I don't want to stand out anymore against culture. Like what's the th thing really behind the thing uh, and to really scrutinize that. Um, and then, and, you know, and then give your life to it. I mean, the Bible talks about the idea of like, you know, those who trust in Jesus are saved those who, and, and what I talk about in the, in the book, in the discipleship chapter is like, this isn't just like a raise my hand at summer camp one time. This mm -hmm. is like every day when you wake up, I want to, I want to be obedient um, mm -hmm. to Jesus. This isn't just Jesus as Lord and savior. This is Jesus as treasure. You know, do you treasure him above everything else in the universe and what he's asked you to do? Uh, because Satan believes Jesus existed and Satan believes Jesus rose from the dead, but it doesn't save him because he doesn't treasure it above everything else in the universe. He doesn't trust to it. He doesn't, you know, mm. put, he, he say, this is why I want to be sitting now. I'm not sure he could, but the point is, <laughs> is that you can, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and we have to, it's, it's the image of not just sitting on a chair, but it's like, do you love the chair? Do you treasure the mm. chair? Do you hug the chair? Do you go, I want to, I want to take joy in the chair for the rest of my life, you know? And, mm. uh, and so that's what I would, you know, that's what I would encourage us to do. So good, Mark. Uh, Mark, thank you for coming back on for doing this again. Awesome. Uh, thanks, thank thanks. Thank you for, for, for sharing this, for giving us not only one awesome book, but two awesome books. Um, for those of you who haven't picked it up yet or even picked up The Problem of God, I highly recommend it. Um, it. It can definitely, even if you're already someone who already believes this stuff, it really helps just reinforce it and then also challenge you. Like, are you, like Mark talked about in the end, like when you wake up every day, are you going, how am I going to follow Jesus today? Or is it more right. just like you're sitting in a chair and yeah, no, that's so good. Mark, thank you for doing this. this thank you great. for having me, sir.